Well, we begin today's show in Japan, where COVID-19 is spiking amidst mounting opposition to the Tokyo Olympic Games, which were delayed by a year because of the pandemic and are scheduled to open July 23rd. This week, Japanese leaders extended a state of emergency in Tokyo and other major cities for several weeks into June because of the pandemic. On Tuesday, leading newspaper Asahi Shimbun, one of the Olympic sponsors, called for cancellation of the Games in an explosive editorial, writing their, quote, simply beyond reason to hold the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics this summer. Meanwhile, the head of a Japanese doctors' union warned against bringing tens of thousands of people from more than 200 countries and territories to Japan, where less than 3 percent of the population is fully vaccinated. In order to win the battle against the coronavirus, we need to stop preparing for the Games, and that is why we are calling for the Tokyo Games to be canceled. There is a possibility that the South African and the Indian variants could spread around the world through the Olympics, and we also cannot deny the possibility of a new variant being generated after the Games. If that were to happen, it would be called the Tokyo Olympics variant, and holding the Games will be condemned in the next hundred years as a foolish act of mankind. An open letter of over 6,000 doctors also called for the um, cancellation of the Olympics. Despite these concerns and ongoing protests, Japanese officials, Olympics organizers and the International Olympic Committee have all vowed the Games will go ahead as a televised event with no foreign spectators. The IOC depends on selling broadcast rights for 75 percent of its income. Meanwhile, an online petition with more than 350,000 signatures calling for the Tokyo Games to be canceled has been submitted to the International Olympic Committee and others. This is Misako Ichimura, a homeless activist and artist who's one of the founding members of the anti-Olympics group Hanguren no Kai in Tokyo. Amidst a spike in COVID-19 infections and an increasingly critical situation for people, the Olympic organizers have resumed preparation for the Olympic Games after a temporary pause. In the vicinity of the stadiums, they have begun setting up an exclusive zone, pushing out the houseless people who have been living there. Construction for the venues have contributed to serious deforestation of the local park. It is also pushing the users of the park into small area, making it difficult for people to keep social distance. On the road where many ambulances are driving tirelessly, brand new exclusive lanes for the Olympics are being built. With 80 percent of Japanese public reported to oppose to the Games and the growing rallying cry to cancel the Olympics, the torch relay has faced protesters everywhere in Japan. It is not welcomed at all. In an attempt to silence the calls for cancellation, the organizers repeat the slogan, safe and secure, but they have no grounds for it. They prioritize the people who are related to the Olympics. The fact that our lives and health are being taken lightly further angers people. That's Misako Ichimura with the Tokyo Anti-Olympics Group. For more, we're joined by two guests. In Nishinomiya, Japan, Satoko Itani is with us, an associate professor of sports, gender and sexuality at Kansai University and a leading Japanese critic of the Games. Also with us from Portland, Oregon, is Jules Boykoff, scholar and former Olympic athlete who played for the U.S. Olympic soccer team from 1989 to 1991. He's published several pieces, his latest this morning in The Washington Post, Tokyo is learning that the only force stronger than a pandemic is the Olympics. His guest essay in The New York Times is headlined, A Sports Event Shouldn't Be a Super Spreader, Cancel the Olympics. He's written four books about the Olympics, his latest headlined, um, No Olympians, Inside the Fight Against Capitalist Megasports in Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Beyond. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Jules, I want to begin with you. For people to understand, who decides if the Olympics in Japan are canceled? This may shock people. I mean, wouldn't the country decide, the country of Japan? Talk about the power of the International Olympic Committee. Each time an Olympic host city gets ready to start the Games, they need to sign a host city contract with the International Olympic Committee, 
those contracts are extremely lopsided in favor of the International Olympic Committee, and it gives them, and only them, the power to cancel the Olympics in a case like this. So when the prime minister of Japan states in public under pressure from people in Japan and around the world to cancel the Olympics, when the prime minister states in public that he actually doesn't have the power to cancel the Olympics, he's absolutely correct. And that's part of a larger state of exception that comes into the Olympic city when the Olympics arrive on your doorstep. There are all sorts of special laws that are put into place, all sorts of special rules that are put into place. New technologies are secured for the Olympics. So for example, in Tokyo, you see facial recognition systems being put in place at all Olympic venues, even though they're known for having a racial bias. Security forces use the Olympics to get all the special weapons and funding they'd normally never be able to get during political or normal political times. And so that's exactly what we're seeing transpire here. The all-powerful IOC that is really a, a privileged sliver of the global 1% is exerting itself and forcing the games ahead against the will of the population. More than 80% of the people in Japan oppose hosting the Olympics this summer, and yet the IOC insists on pressing ahead. Satoko uh, Itani, if you could uh, explain what the significance is uh, of one of the key sponsors of the Olympics and a major newspaper, uh, Asahi Shimbum, uh, coming out against saying that the Olympics should not be held, uh, was that uh, a surprise uh, in Japan? And, and are you expecting other sponsors to also come out in opposition? Um. Hi, uh, Nareen, and hi, Amy. First of all, thank you so much for having me today on your show. Um, in terms of the significance of the Asahi Shimbun speaking against the Olympics, is that, well, I have to say first, it came too late. Um, now they, to me, now they are taking that side against the Olympics because it is becoming very clear the public will not support this Olympics and they will face, continue to face the harsh criticism after the Olympics over. And what about the fact that there's such widespread opposition, as Jules just mentioned, over 80 percent of the public in Japan are opposed to the Olympics taking place? How are they expressing their opposition and what kind of response has the government uh, in Japan given to the opposition? Well, Yes, so there have been many protests um, from many years ago, ever since the beginning, uh, ever since the game was awarded to Tokyo, which was 2013, there are small groups of anti-Olympic activists have been speaking tirelessly against the Olympics and pointing out many issues way before the pandemic hit Japan. So, and after the, uh, the torch relay began, not just the, these main groups that have been working for years, there are smaller groups of people popping out in many parts of the Japan against the, against the Toshi Relay and the Olympic itself. Satoko so, Tony, can you talk about the level of protest? I mean, you have 6,000 doctors calling for the cancellation. Um, <clears throat> you have the torch group, the ones that are running to ultimately light the torch in, uh, in Tokyo. A number of them are now COVID positive. You have thousands of athletes coming from around the world, many from countries that have not gotten vaccines, the countries themselves, let alone the athletes, and vaccines are not being required at the Olympics. Um, so, uh, the, the, obviously, there is a great, great health risks, uh, public health risks, not just to Japan, but around the world. And again, as you pointed out, Amy, there are less than 3% of the population in Japan currently has been vaccinated. And the, going back to your earlier question, the government of Japan have only repeated that their decision, they don't have a power to decide. The IOC has. And the only response the IOC has had to the people's opposition or the people's uh, protests are that no matter what, even if the Japan or the whole city is under the state of emergency, the game will go on. And uh, Dick Pound recently said that the Olympic will succeed and will be held unless there is an unprecedented um, Armageddon. And this is the voices that we've been hearing. So uh, reasonably, People in Japan are increasingly angry 
and feeling the, the great sense of unfairness and the wrong priorities on the part of the IOC, organizing committee, and the Japanese government. They feel that the people are not protected. But I have to emphasize, Amy, um, this did not just start after the beginning of the pandemic. When the uh, game was awarded in 2013, it was only two years after the Japan experienced this triple disaster of massive um, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown. And the, we knew, the public knew, it was going to require a huge amount of money and resources to recover from that. But all these monies and resources have been put towards the Olympics, and the, uh, the recovery itself has been delayed. And, uh, Jules Boykoff, could you respond to the fact, I mean, a number of people have, of course, uh, expressed dissatisfaction with the measures that the Olympic organizers in uh, Tokyo have put in place. What are some of those measures? I mean, the New England Journal of, of Medicine came out saying that those measures are in sufficient, but the article's lead author suggested that appropriate and safe measures could be put in place and the games could go ahead. She did not say uh, that it was necessary to cancel the Olympics. So the International Olympic Committee, in conjunction with Tokyo organizers, have issued what they call playbooks for different groups of people that will be attending the Olympics, whether they're athletes, whether they're journalists, whether they're volunteers. And these playbooks lay out in clear terms what is going to be in place in terms of these measures. And that New England Journal of Medicine article that you mentioned basically pointed out that a lot of what are in these playbooks is essentially hygiene theater, talking about cleaning off surfaces and things that everybody knows at this point, like wearing a mask and social distancing and so on. The fact of the matter is, it's incredibly difficult to pull that off with such a huge mega event like the Olympics. We're talking about 11,000 athletes for the Olympics, 80,000 people or so will be coming into the country from all around the world, as you mentioned, none of whom will be required to be vaccinated, none of whom will be quarantined, and many of whom can't actually get a vaccination because they're too young. Many Olympic sports have people in them who are not 15 years old. It depends on the sport, and they determine the age. So there's all sorts of complicating factors. And that's not even to bring in the Paralympics, where you have many athletes uh, who will be especially susceptible to coronavirus and all its variants. And so the International Olympic Committee has come under all sorts of pressure about these playbooks. One other thing about them, though, an athlete who is Tokyo-bound, who I've been in communication with, recently shared with me a waiver, basically, that they are being asked to sign in order to participate in the Olympics. And when I read this waiver, I found it bracing. It said explicitly in the waiver that if this individual were to contract coronavirus and, in fact, die, they would not hold liable the responsible parties for the Olympics. And this is something the individual is being asked to sign just to participate in the Olympics. Now, as an athlete, I've signed plenty of waivers in my life. But seeing just it spelled out in such terms, I found quite ghastly. And that's what we're really looking at here. We're looking at the International Olympic Committee that seems to be perfectly willing to have people in Tokyo and Japan dying so that they can make a killing. I wanted to go to the IOC um, to play a clip of uh, the IOC officials who held a news conference um, in Tokyo um, talking about, uh, well, President Seiko Hoshimoto tried to reassure reporters about the effectiveness of the organization's protocols. From February to mid-May, about a 1,000 people had been given a special grant to enter Japan, where Tokyo 2020 took the responsibility for their entry. There was one person that tested positive at the airport, but zero cases during the 14-day period where activities were restricted. This proved the coronavirus measures from the second version of the playbook actually worked. So, Jules Boykoff, if you can talk about this remarkable situation um, where you have a country that's spiking with COVID and you have this enormous pressure of the IOC. It could be that l country IOCs will um, go bankrupt if, again, the Olympics aren't held. If you can talk more about the big business of the IOC and also about the athletes, um, what happens to athletes who've been preparing for these years? 
Yeah, well, listening to the officials in Tokyo as well as the International Olympic Committee sounds a bit like a parrot enrolled in a repetition contest on Groundhog's Day. They say the same thing over and over and over again about how we're going to have a safe Olympics. But you're right. Money machinations are definitely happening behind the scenes, and that really animates why we're seeing the Olympics press ahead under pandemic conditions. As you mentioned in the lead-in, the International Olympic Committee gets around 75 percent of its revenues from broadcasters in the United States, like NBC, almost 75 percent. Add to that another 18 percent from corporate sponsors like Coca-Cola, Alibaba, et cetera, and you're looking at more than nine out of every $10 that lands in the International Olympic Committee's coffers coming from those two sources. So with that in mind, it makes a lot of sense that the International Olympic Committee would be willing to hold a made-for-TV event with no people in the stands if necessary, because if you can put the event on television, then you can have that money flowing into your coffers. They make the argument that they spread the money out to the world, and that is true to a certain degree. They do share quite a bit of the revenues to uh, sporting groups, uh, National Olympic Committees around the world and international federations of sport. Um, but whether that really means that we should go ahead with an Olympics under pandemic conditions is another matter. I guess I'm just a little bit more willing to listen to the medical experts than I am to people who have a vested economic interest in pulling off these Olympics. And uh, Satoko Itani, very quickly before we conclude, could you explain what you think some of the reasons are that Japan has uh, such a low rate of vaccination, in fact, the lowest of all OECD countries? Well, I think the first is a failure of um, the diplomacy. During the 2020, many countries made efforts to acquire the uh, vaccine because Japan is, doesn't make the, its own vaccination. It was essential, but the government failed to acquire them. And now the number seems to be available but the distribution hasn't been very poor. So because of the poor distribution plan, the cities around the country are scrambling to figure out where to vaccinate, in what order, and how to uh, transport. So the government has, has majorly failed to create this distribution plan. And this is partly because of their failure to predict this pandemic. The China or the Korea have, have the experience of previous SARS um, epidemic, and they have set up and they have prepared since then to respond to this situation, but the Japanese government haven't. What they have done instead was reducing the number of hospital beds, reducing the number of funding to the public hospitals. And also, if you could address this issue of the International Olympic Committee once again um, talking about politics and banning expression of politics, um, the Olympics banning Black Lives Matter apparel, and the recent vote to uphold a rule that prohibits any kind of demonstration or political, religious, or racial propaganda. Today in our headlines, we just reported on the death of Lee Evans, who a few days after the world-renowned protest uh, in the uh, Mexico Mexico City Olympics of um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, when they put up their hand in the Black Power salute, he did that very thing as the U.S. national anthem played, protesting uh, for uh, Black Power in the United States against poverty and for human rights. Um, can you talk about that power of the IOC to say no to those kinds of expressions and what that means for Japan? Well, the, you, uh, the IOC has used this policy to really suppress and silence the opposing voices. And this is going to be a major issue in Japan, because if you look at the, what the pandemic has shown is that this is very political event. The decisions to protect the people in Japan have been even um, compromised because the IOC has such huge power and money interest. And yet to say that the uh, people in Japan and the athletes cannot voice is only protect the IOC. And they, it shows that they do not care what happened to the people in the hosting countries and to the athletes. Well, so this, this really speaks to the fallacy of the Olympic brand and Olympism. I want to thank you so much for uh, being with us. Um, 
Just a comment, though, this is not the Olympics. Uh, at the last U.S. Open, during the tournament, Naomi Osaka, who has a Japanese mother and a Haitian-American father, donned seven masks, each bearing the name of a black person who was killed uh, by police. Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, um, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Philando Castile, and Tamir Rice. Um, Satoko Itani, I want to thank you for being with us, Associate Professor of Sports, Gender and Sexuality at Kansai University, and also Jules Boykoff, former Olympic athlete, author of four books on the Olympics. We'll link to your two pieces in The Washington Post and The New York Times, as you speak to us from Portland, Oregon. Next up, President Biden has ordered U.S. intelligence agencies to investigate the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic to determine if the virus was accidentally leaked from a Chinese lab. We'll look at this and other COVID issues with Dr. Monica Gandhi. Stay with us.